Good morning, brothers and sisters. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's service is in the shadow of the cross, as we see our Savior being treated like a common criminal, dying for me, dying for you, dying for the whole of humanity. But today we also meet in the shadow of uncertainty. The shadow of this COVID-19 virus, which is attacking people regardless of who we are. My prayer for this service is that we would be reminded of the incredible love of our Lord as He, in obedience to His Father, became our sacrifice. In this service, we will hear our Lord Jesus speaking from the cross through each of our preachers as they bring forth the seven words. May he speak into all our lives, bringing renewed hope and new life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as you look down upon us today, I pray that you would come and speak to everyone who hears today's message lifting our hearts and souls with your amazing grace, that the seven words of Jesus would feed us, strengthen us, equip us, challenge us to live for you, and call us to walk with you each and every day as faithfully as we possibly can. Meet with us and reveal that you are greater than anything that this world could ever throw at us. Spirit of the living God, come and move and enable each speaker to share the gospel of life in and through these coming words. In Jesus' name we pray, to the glory of the Father. Amen. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We find our scripture reading this morning from the Gospel according to Luke in chapter 23. We commence reading from verse 32 to verse 34. Luke chapter 23, reading from verse 32 to verse 34 and it reads as follows two others criminals were also led away to be executed with him when they arrived at the place called the skull they crucified him there along with the criminal criminals one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. This is the word of God. Friends, this morning, I'm going to briefly share with you on the readings that was taken from the Gospel of Luke. Number one, while Jesus was on the cross, he made seven statements or seven utterances. And my task today is to present to you the first utterance of Jesus Christ which says Father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. The procession arrives at Mount Calvary or, or Golgotha and it's on Friday morning about nine o'clock. Jesus is between the two criminals hanging on the cross. 
the soldiers have fastened Jesus on the cross by driving sharp nails through his hands and feet, and they raised the cross. Around the cross there gathered crowds of people who shouted their hate words. Around the cross there were people who were accusing, casting stones of weight to Jesus Christ, accusing Jesus Christ. And Jesus had already been sentenced by Pontius Pilate. And now they arrived at a place called Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. And Jesus looked at all these people who were gathered there, all these enemies who were accusing him, all those who had put him on the cross, Pontius Pilate, the soldiers, Judas, the crowd, and probably us, as we also share in the death of Jesus Christ. And he looked at them and he says, Father, forgive them, for all of them, they do not know what they are doing. They are ignorant. They do not know what they are doing here. Jesus has taught us that even when the life throws stones at us, we must also pray for those who throw stones at us. We must not seek revenge. Jesus prayed this prayer to God to forgive these people who are treating him like an outcast, who are treating him like an enemy when he was in fact their Messiah. Jesus says to the Father, forgive them, Father. And one other thing that I want to bring to your attention here it is the relationship of Jesus Christ and his Father. When he says Father, he knew who his Father was, and he knew that he had a relationship with, with God, and that's why he referred to God as Father. And so he says, forgive them. Jesus is still praying for us even today. Jesus is still praying for the world even today. Jesus is still praying for the ignorant even today. When the whole world is faced with the coronavirus, there are still people who are still ignorant. There are people out there who are still making jokes out of this problem that the whole world is facing. There are people out there who are still forwarding improper, improper uh, messages about coronavirus. And thus Jesus is saying, Father, Forgive all these people, for they do not know what they are doing. And today, I want to say to all of you, we can be sure that even today Jesus is praying for us, for the whole world. He's saying, forgive them all, for they do not know what they are doing. And this tells us that as Christians, we must learn to forgive no matter how hard it is, but we must learn to, to forgive. May God bless you all. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. morning comes from Luke chapter 23 and I'll be reading from verse 39 to 43. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? 
and we are indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of our Lord. Amen. Today you will be with me in paradise, scripture says. The image of the three crosses and the three men hanging on them comes into sharp focus when we read the scripture. Three symbols of living. Two men hanging on either side of Jesus were criminals. They had broken the law. And then there is Jesus. Three different people hung on three crosses and we get to overhear their last words that they ever speak. And we remember the words of someone dying are so important because they speak of what they have lived, what they have loved, and what's important to them. One of the men spent his last few hours being angry, hurling anger at anyone and everyone, and especially Jesus. His anger blinded him to hope. Anger in our lives does that. Resentments, hurts, and hatreds can be so destructive. What blinds us to hope, to the hope of Christ this morning? When anger fills our heads, there is no room left for change or for hope because it consumes us. It fills us and we live out of it. I remember a few years ago being so angry with someone I felt had wronged me deeply. So angry. Until a colleague said, Kim, why don't you have some compassion for X? His words felt like someone had physically slapped me. And they sunk deep into my soul and quietened my so-called self-righteous anger. I often think about that man on the cross. And I wondered if he chose to be angry instead of afraid. And what the scriptures would have recorded if he had said, Father, forgive me, remember me too to Jesus when you come into your kingdom. The second man Something happens, something life-changing dawns on him. I believe that he realizes who Jesus is when the nails are hammered into Jesus' hands and feet and Jesus cries out not in pain or anger, but words for the healing of the world. Father, forgive them. So the man cries out, Jesus, remember me. I've always believed that we need to seek forgiveness first, but on the cross, the word of forgiveness is spoken first. And it gives birth to the man's remorseful cry to his God. So what if we who seek forgiveness discover how deeply and how much we have been forgiven already? How will that change our living? Jesus always responds to our slightest sin of regret or remorse or sorrow. Jesus' words today, truly you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is not a place we go to. Paradise is not what the world offers, but what Jesus offers. Paradise is relationship with the lover of our soul. Paradise is knowing God. Paradise is the presence of God in all circumstances of life. That's real paradise. Knowing that there is no place that God cannot be, Jesus knew that. He faced the agony of the cross, the desperate aloneness, the feeling that God was silent. And yet in and above that, Jesus knew that relationship with the Father was the only paradise he needed. Friends, the times we face are difficult. 
this isolation of church when every fiber of our being longs to be together. But here's the invitation from this passage. When we turn to Jesus, we will never be alone and we will enter into the only paradise that comes. Amen. of Christ on the cross we find on the gospel in the gospel according to John chapter 19 from verse 25 to verse 27 it reads as thus near the cross of Jesus stood his mother his mother's sister Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene when Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. This is the word of God. Heavenly Father, O gracious God, we come before you and we thank you for your word, for it is a life of gracious God. Pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart may be pleasing in your sight. My God and my Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It has been a very, very long night. A night filled with false accusations, emotional and physical torment. And the morning was not off to a great start. Christ has been sentenced to crucifixion. He's been nailed to the cross and the insults just keep coming. When giving an account of the people who were gathered around the cross, the writer of this gospel chooses to first zoom in to four characters, which is the four soldiers and four women who stand close to the cross. On the one hand, the first group, which is the group of soldiers, is rejoicing because they have done a splendid job. While on the other hand, the other group is shattered and heartbroken, seeing their savior on the cross. But amongst these four women is the one who feels the greatest pain, and the best way to describe the pain that she is feeling is through the words of Simeon, who describes it as a pain that resembles a sword piercing the soul. And as they gaze upon the cross, as the Savior hangs upon the cross, the internal weeping of the mother is heard by her son and the excruciating pain that she feels is felt by her son. Adding to the pain that Christ was already experiencing because of being on the cross, he feels the pain of his mother. But even, even in that pain, Christ does something that an ordinary human being would struggle to do. Instead of allowing all the attention to be focused on him, Christ shifts the focus. He shifts the focus from himself to someone else, becoming a perfect example of a wounded healer. He is covered in wounds, but even in that state, he chooses to be a healer to another. You know, they say hurt people hurt other people. But here on the cross, Christ shows us that in fact, hurt people possess the ability to heal others. Yes, you might have been hurt. 
Yes, you might have been abused. Yes, you might have gone through so many painful things, but today Christ shows us that even hurt people possess the ability to heal others. Now, as he is on the cross, knowing that he can no longer protect, care, and provide for his mother, Christ entrusts her to the beloved disciple, the ninth character who is introduced in this gospel. He entrusts his beloved mother to his beloved disciple so that he can be the one who will provide who will care and who will fill the void that was there. The question, however, this morning to us is, can Christ entrust another human being into your care, even if they might not be from your own space, from your own context, from your own house? Can Christ entrust another living being into your care. To the men in the midst of your gender-based violence, in the midst of the kidnappings, in the midst of human trafficking, can you be entrusted to care, to protect for the women and the children in your life? In the midst of this coronavirus, the Minister of Social Development expressed her concern about the spike in cases of domestic violence during this quarantine. Again, I ask you, can you be trusted? Can Christ trust you with the life of another? Will you be able to care for another, even if they're not from the same space as you? May the Lord bless the preaching of his word now and forevermore. Amen. Dear friends, as we remain at the foot of the cross, we hear one of the loudest cries that I imagine Christ ever made. As we hear it from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 27, I read from verse 45 and at verse 46. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour darkness came all over the land and about the ninth hour Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Come, let us pray. Such agony, O oh God. And yet, embedded in such agony, there's so much love. Such darkness, and yet within that darkness, the light that John tells us no darkness could ever extinguish was there. And in these times of uncertainty, these moments of fear, these moments of lockdown, be the light that shines with in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are strange words to be coming out of the mouth of our Savior. 
for him to cry out that God may have forsaken him. Such strange words. Strange words that are coming from the Savior, the one who taught us that God is not to be domesticated, never to be personalized. God is for us. And yet, we hear our Savior using the singular language. My God, the personalizing language. My God, the possessing language. My God. These words could only mean that things indeed were difficult for Jesus at this point. Where logic almost escapes us. And yet we know, and yet we know even in those moments, that there is a God. That God is there. Whether God is at a distance, whether God is close at hand, all we know is that in our moments of trouble, there is God. And so perhaps then, even for Jesus in these moments of agony, he had to remind himself that God is still there. And I'm wondering whether, wouldn't you be reminded, wouldn't you be reminded this morning of the presence of God, no matter what darkness you are going through, no matter what agony you are going through, no matter what anxiety you are going through, no matter what lifelessness you are faced with, May you be aware of God's presence this morning. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We're also being reminded by these words of the tug of war that may be happening at this stage. The one who was without sin is now carrying all the sin of the world. Where must Jesus run to? The world is pulling him with all the weight of its sin, and yet the faithfulness of God still continues to draw Jesus to his faithfulness in saving the world. The moments in our lives when we are caught up in between the moments of being faithful to God and yet the realities of life continue to wear us down. It is in those moments, my friends, that we have to remember that God remains faithful. It is in those moments that we need to remember that we are not alone. No matter, no matter how dark things may be, may we know the love of God that pulls us towards the Savior and not the destruction of the world. We are reminded this morning as Jesus cries out that there are things that need to be fulfilled. For these words are not written for the first time in Scripture. These are the words that Jesus may have read in the temple. These are the words that Jesus may have read in the synagogues. This is the scroll that Jesus may have read to the people as he read from the book of Isaiah, as he read from the book of Psalms. Something had to be fulfilled here. It is Isaiah who tells us that the Savior will come and will suffer. And as the, as the Savior suffers, we are reminded, therefore, that there is a moment when it feels as though God is not with him. The severity of the brutality, the severity of sin cannot be underestimated even by God, even by God's Son. And I invite you, therefore, that you don't take things lightly, for God never takes things lightly. For the one who has come to save the world is now in touch with the realities of this world. And I invite you, therefore, to take your pain just as Jesus did. Take it to God. 
For indeed, what a savior we have in Jesus. All we need to do is to take all that pain to God. If these don't sound like words of agony for you, may they sound as words of prayer for you. That we are reminded at this time of agony and pain that we can't forget to pray. In moments of anxiety, we have got to remember to pray. Indeed, as Jesus had taught his disciples, we need no long prayers. And yet the prayer he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is a prayer that says it all. Even the fulfillment of his teaching, therefore, is being fulfilled by him practicing what he has been preaching. And perhaps, as we sit at the foot of the cross, may we be reminded, therefore, of the things that still need to be fulfilled about the presence of God in our lives. Even though darkness may engulf us, I remind you, friends, there is a light that continues to shine. God has not forsaken Jesus. It may feel as though he has forgotten you. And I pray to God that you will experience more and more of God this Easter. As you pray to him, as you open up to him, as you become vulnerable not only to the world, but also making yourself vulnerable to God, who is the Savior of the world. May God bless you. reading this morning from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to St. John, the 19th chapter, and we read verses 28 and 29. And we read this for us. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of the vinegar on his soap and held it to his mouth. This is the word of the Lord. Come, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you again this morning with hearts full of joy as we recognize and express our gratefulness for your death on the cross for we are who we are because of your death our salvation and now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you my lord and my savior Amen. Amen. Friends, brothers and sisters, I think it is of utmost importance that I draw your attention to the one who actually authored the words I thirst. And this is the author of the fourth gospel, John, the son of Zebedee also referred to as the disciple whom Jesus Christ loved, one of Jesus' disciples. John records three of the seven last words. He's the only one recording this word, I thirst. And it would be important for us to also understand that when Jesus says, I thirst, for there are so many things and drinks that people thirst for. But here I want to 
categorically state that he thirsts for water. And having said that, it becomes then important that we look at the author John himself and the theology of water. And when one reads the first chapter of the book of John, the introduction there of God incarnate in verse 3, note the following, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. But you also look at the second chapter of the book of John at the wedding at Cana of Galilee, where Jesus Christ was able to turn water into wine. And I want you to also note the restoration of the groom's dignity through water, because if it wasn't because of the presence of Christ at that particular wedding, then the restoration of the groom's dignity wouldn't have happened. I also want to draw your attention, my brother, my sister, to the third chapter as we look into the theology of that which Christ thirsts for, water. In the third chapter, the night encounter with Nicodemus the Pharisee, and you note know the fifth verse thereof, wherein he said, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water. You underline that, unless they are born of water and spirit. I also want to continue because the fourth chapter continues with the conversation that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob. The woman goes to the well because she is in need of water. Maybe the words, I thirst, are more relevant here. There she encounters the creator, the main source of water. She encounters Jesus Christ, also referred by scripture as the living water. She encounters the living water. The conversation between the Samaritan woman and Jesus Christ leads to self-realization. It leads to confession. It leads to belief, but it also leads to the conversion of the Samaritan woman. She receives the water given to her by Jesus Christ and leaves the jar of the usual water for they had a conversation and they spoke about a different kind of water. And as she leaves the well going into the village, she then leaves the jar of the usual water there. And I want to say indeed, the proclamation in the village, it's proof of water which turns into springs and streams which runs to eternal life because even when the Bible doesn't give us the numbers of those who were converted then, but I want to believe that and I want to state that it is thousands and thousands of people who came to believe because they have received the true water that actually sat at the well of Jacob. And John's perspective of the saying, I thirst, generally the word is viewed as a cry of extreme pain, as a cry and of extreme suffering and radical vulnerability. For John, each of the three sayings in his book from the cross shows that Jesus is in command. It shows that Jesus Christ is accomplishing God's purpose and, and he is dying victoriously. The vinegar also referred to as the oxus. It could have been intended 
as a narcotic to relieve or a hostile gesture to increase Jesus' pain and suffering. And they gave him vinegar. They gave him what is referred to as the oxos. You know, Psalm 22, friends, has many passages that are used in the Passion narrative. So when Jesus says, I thirst, he is not speaking from his real mortal weakness. He speaks from his sovereign control of his mission. This person who says, I thirst, the one who says, I thirst, this is the son of God. This is the second person of the, of the Trinity. And this is the one who actually fulfills scripture for it is in this way, the fifth way, where we also come to understand the fulfillment of scripture itself. Even in the midst of his helpless condition, he is manifestly aware of his, of his divine destiny. In chapter 10, Jesus Christ says, I lay down my life for my sheep. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down for my own accord. So the crucifixion, it's not an accident. No, it's not an accident. It's not an accident. It's not even a mistake. It's not an unfortunate slip up. No. It is a deliberate self-offering of good shepherd. So when he says, I thirst, it is to show that he is fulfilling his purpose according to the plan of God from the beginning. The salvation plan has come to fruition. I thirst. And it is only through the thirst of the Lord Jesus Christ that we today are called disciples. We today are able to stand with our heads held high for he thirsted for us. And may the Lord bless you as you begin to understand the thirst of Jesus at the cross. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we now find our sixth word from the Gospel according to John, chapter 19, verse 30. And it reads as thus, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Come, let us pray. Give us the grace to hear you once again, O oh God, one more time. Speak to us. Give us the grace once again, O oh God, to open our hearts so that that which is of you may emerge within us as we reflect on your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, we find this precise statement by Jesus on the cross. After all that has happened, Jesus is clear. It is finished. Whether those around him had come to the realization of that but for jesus it was clear it is finished 
Perhaps then John, indeed in his style of writing, takes us to the moment when that which God came here for is done. To create a new community of believers, people then who would glorify God, it is finished. It is a moment when indeed God knows that there can be no other work needed except that which God has already done. It is finished. Isn't it important for us, therefore, to recognize the things that God has done without having to look for more that God can still do? Can't you recognize in your own life the work that God has done that it is finished? We live in a world of consumerism where we always look up for more. And yet for Jesus, we hear at the stage that it is finished. And may it be finished with you, all the work that God has done in your life, all the work of salvation, may you know that it is finished. No need for you to look for more. It is done. In the English language, when we hear then of this common noun, it, it is all inclusive. It takes care of everything. And therefore, may you hear the conclusive statement that it is finished. It is finished. It is a moment of transition for Jesus Christ. For Christ knows that he has done all that he needed to do here. It is finished. We live in a world that doesn't, that doesn't accept transitions well. We live in a world that people don't realize that there is a moment to be at work and a moment to hand over. It is finished. It is a moment of transition that Jesus knows is important for humanity, therefore, to begin to take over as the disciples would later on. It is finished. And I'm wondering what transitions is God calling you into for you to realize that it is finished. Jesus will then bow down and bow his head and leave the stage. How about we allow some of the things, therefore, that need to leave us to leave our lives at this stage, for it is finished. We can't go back to them. We can't go back to those things because Jesus Christ has said it is finished. And I trust that God will help you to realize that the work that he has done in your life is finished. There's no need for more. I hope that you will realize that indeed there's a moment of handing over for it is finished. Whatever it is that God has been doing in your life, it is finished. May God bless you for it is finished. Amen. reading in the gospel according to St. Luke, the 23rd chapter, and we are reading verse 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. At Golgotha, 
Jesus is crucified. As if that was not enough, he is mocked, insulted, yet he does not retaliate. We have instead heard him utter sayings, Six sayings already have come from the mouth that never lies. We are now to hear the seventh saying. Number seven is a number for perfection, for completion. And we have heard Jesus saying, it is finished. Also, number seven is a number that symbolizes rest. In the first creation narrative, the Bible tells us that God worked for six days and on the seventh day he entered rest. So we come at this moment to witness Jesus' last saying on the cross, Father, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Allow me to say, as I borrow from the pulpit commentary, and say that this is Jesus' farewell to earth and his entrance greeting to the heaven. And I wish to speak briefly, time permitting, on victory relationship and assurance. When an army goes out into battle and the soldiers come back, some limping, some maimed with wounds. Their posture and the sound that they make tells those who are not in battle how the battle has come out and turned out to be. And so the Bible says Jesus called out in a loud voice. And having finished his mission on earth, he made this bold statement. Unlike others who, when they are crucified, perhaps they whisper, or perhaps they entrust their souls to people, or perhaps curse and swear at the soldiers who crucify them. Yet Jesus does not place his soul, he does not place his spirit in, in the hands of his crucifiers. He does not place his hand, his life in the hands of people, for he knew what kind people are. His loud cries of victory, victory over sin, because now sin is blotted out forever for all those who will believe in him. And as he calls out in his loud voice, he calls out so that his disciples may know. He calls out so that us, his followers, those who believe in him, may know that he laid down his life for our salvation. And as Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 63, there are ways I will paraphrase. Who is this walking in majesty? coming. He says, it is I mighty to save. I was alone as I worked out salvation for the people. And so as Jesus makes this loud call, he is reporting to heaven that, Father, the work that you have sent me to earth to do, it is accomplished. Indeed, the suffering servant led as a silent lamb before the slaughterers has accomplished the purpose. But then again, as he cries out in this loud voice, Jesus speaks to his relationship with the Father as we heard that he had this relationship with the Father. And let me say that it is one of the things that caused him to be in conflict with the law holders, the priests, the rabbis, the scribes. 
because they were saying that he wants to be equal with God. How can you say that he is the son of God? I mean, when he said he is the son of God, he was questioned. Remember in the wilderness of temptation, the tempter came and said, if you are the son of God, turn the stones to become bread. But then again, here at Golgotha, the people who are jeering at him, insulting him, even one of those crucified with him says, if you are the son of God, save yourself and save us. But I want to say that as we had in the fourth saying, when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is because when God looked at his son, all he could see was sin. God was on him. And God could not look. The connection between the father and the son was disturbed. That is why the Bible tells us there was darkness covering the whole earth for a period of three days. But can I introduce something? You know, when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, he alone goes there to offer sacrifices. And the author of Hebrews says, Jesus went into the Holy of Holies, not with the blood of goats, but with his own blood to offer sacrifices. And, and we have the priest Jesus who goes and disappears in, from the sight. And as he carries the sin of the world, he goes into the Holy of Holies. That is why, as he came out, when the light, the sun could shine again, the connection being restored between him and the Father. The Bible says the curtain in the temple was torn from the beginning, from the top to the bottom, because there was now an access that was given for all who believed to come to God because Jesus had come to restore humanity back to God, that there should no more be sin that prevents us to be able to go to God. That is why, as Jesus says, Father, he once again affirms his relationship. I know at times we go through circumstances and situations where it feels like there is no connection between us and God. But if we cry out, putting our trust in God, because this was the prayer of trust that Jesus had in this Father, that even us, when we trust in God and we call to God, God comes through for us and helps us in our moment of need. We are also encouraged to place our trust in God. And Christians have taken after this model of prayer. If you read in Acts chapter 7, verse 59, when Stephen was slow, the Bible says, he cried out and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And one of the forerunners of Reformation, John Huss, it is said that as he was led into the state to be banned, because it was said he was a heretic, as his enemies were, in, were having insults at him, committing his soul to the devil, the the history tells us that he was singing and chanting praises to God because he had this relationship. His trust was in God. And as he went in there, he said, Lord Jesus, I commit my soul, my spirit into your hand, for you have redeemed it. We can also trust. We can also trust God in our moments of trouble. And lastly, when one knows where they are going, they do not fear. It doesn't matter the dark valley that they go through, but they know whom they are with and where they are going. And there is calm and blessed assurance. And Jesus voluntarily laid down his life, his spirit, as he cried out, he cried out in this loud voice. He decided to lay down his life. Remember when he was teaching in John chapter 10, verse 18, he says that no one takes my life but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and also the authority to take it up again. Jesus gave up his spirit. 
He did not die. And I like what the evangelists say. None of them say that he died. But he say, they say he gave up his spirit because it is unnatural for one to die six, after six hours of crucifixion. Authors and scholars say that it would take days. But when Jesus knew that everything was finished, he decided to lay down his life. My friend, Jesus became a sin for us so that he can become the righteousness of God. He came in love to redeem humanity. Yes, even through death on the cross, his relationship with the Father remained intact. And at this time, where as a country, and as the whole world, we are faced with fires from within and without as we're facing this pandemic of corona virus, where we are not sure of what is going to happen tomorrow when life storms batter against us. We have a heaven, we have a shelter in the hands of God. And I wish to encourage each and every one of us, wherever we are at this moment, to have this blessed assurance that when you cry out to God and trust, God hears our prayer. God helps us because God has promised never to leave, never to forsake us. I know Jesus cried out in a loud voice and he gave up his spirit. Perhaps you are saying that I'm not dying. I'm not like Jesus. And so what? But I wish to say that as this was part of Psalm 31 verse 5, where in children in Israel were taught by their mothers to say this prayer as they were going to sleep that we can take this prayer, each and every one of us, and make it our daily prayer as we go in and as we go out to say, Father, no matter what I face on the, on, the, on the life's highway, no matter what I face tomorrow, no matter what I face next week, no matter what I face next year, I commit my spirit into your hands. May God bless you. Amen. Friends, that brings the close to our Good Friday service. We as the ministers of the Rutherford Circuit so desperately wanted to connect with everyone, remind everyone that Easter is not cancelled, that God is with us and always will. So may you go now and see one another and hear one another and love one another because that's what we're called to do in His name. Amen.